and good morning or good evening wherever you are in the world. My name is Priscilla Henley. I am the Vice President of Access HR. Access HR has over 25 years of experience of being an HR-focused employee benefits firm. With over 500 clients, and we have access to all the U.S. carriers and markets. Our high level of intimacy with presenting options for cost savings coupled with our service has been very unique and has been at the forefront of U.S. administrating um, employee benefits for our clients. As our U.S. companies have continued to expand internationally, HR can experience challenges that may include compliance, recruiting, retention, employee complaints, cost concerns, and difficulty obtaining credible information regarding competitive benefits practices with their um, affiliates uh, throughout the world. So we have joined forces with Globex, who has been a great partner to be able to offer that expertise and service to our current clients. I'm going to pass it on to Valentin, who is a Senior Consultant for International Benefits with Globex. Valentin? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Priscilla. Uh, Globex International is uh, an international benefits and uh, property and casualty firm and uh, we work with this selected number of uh, partner brokers around the United States and uh, Access HR is one of our partners, a great partner and uh, that's just one uh, a facet that we are doing today in, in uh, talking about the subject of uh, data privacy and data governance internationally, but uh, our core uh, benefits uh, expertise uh, uh, lay with the subject of uh, international benefits for the local nationals and expatriate uh, type of uh, programs. And uh, the uh, webinar that we're having today is uh, possible due to the knowledge and expertise of our friends uh, uh, from uh, FIPS STEP, uh, the consultancy firm that helps organizations around the world uh, uh, to deal with the issues of privacy and data governance. And uh, without a further ado, I would like to uh, uh, introduce uh, the CEO of that firm, Darren Ray, who will uh, take on, on the presentation from that moment on. Thank you very much, guys. That's a great introduction, and uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today um, talking about uh, the important aspects of uh, data privacy, data privacy. I'll try and keep my American pronunciation uh, going. Um, so data privacy and uh, data protection is the, the key things that we're going to be talking about. So a couple of pieces of uh, housekeeping and the objectives that we've got today. We're going to be talking about data privacy and data protection around the world and we're going to highlight some of the key differences between the requirements in the US, uh, the uh, European Union, Latin America, and Asia Pacific. We're going to talk about what GDPR is and how it may affect your business. We're also going to talk about the actions you may need to take in uh, preparing for GDPR. As I said, uh, we we're going to record uh, this, uh, this webinar, uh, so it will be available after the event. So if, you, uh, if you've got colleagues who didn't manage to uh, get here today, then they'll be able to download it from our YouTube channel and as a podcast as well. If you do have any questions during the course of the presentation, then to, do please just ask them within the, web, the webinar application, and I'll try and answer them as we go along. Uh, if not, we'll get to those at the end. So here we are with a, a high-level picture of what data privacy, data privacy looks like around the world, and this is a high-level picture. There are greater, uh, there's greater granularity to this picture, but this gives you some of the high-level uh, requirements of, of uh, and, and crossover between the uh, the various regulation around the world. So let's start with uh, let's start with Argentina. Argentina actually has uh, some relatively good. Uh, data protection and data privacy requirements. It's one of the countries that has been recognised as European by the European Union as having uh, GDPR equivalency, which is uh, quite good. Uh, 
It does have uh, some slight differences, and I've summarized those on this uh, infographic type uh, slide here, uh, identifying all the different ones that require a CISO or a data protection officer. So a CISO, for those who are not familiar with that term, is a Chief Information Security Officer. That's usually, usually the executive who is responsible for information security within an organization. And a data protection officer is the person who's responsible for the data protection. Um, and very often organizations who have a CISO, they may have their data protection officer, um, the CISO and the DPO are the same person. But some organizations will have uh, both roles represented there. So in Argentina, we recognize or they recognize uh, personal data. Uh, and the concept of personal data we'll talk about in more depth as we, uh, as we go through these slides. Uh, they don't recognize quite so much the, uh, the need for consent, uh, and we will talk about the importance of that as we go through, and they don't have breach notification at this point. Uh, they're also not uh, geosensitive, uh, meaning that they, um, the, the requirements um, uh, to keep data in one particular country or not to export the data are not in place for Argentina. Talking about Canada, the next, uh, there's no requirement for a CISO or a DPO, as you can see. Uh, they do have uh, recognition of at least some aspects of personal data. Um, now, in Canada, it's really, uh, the regulation is really focused around uh, anti-spam regulation. Um, so it's important that uh, you differentiate as we look at these things that not all data protection is, is equal. Uh, there is a recognition, a recognition of uh, consent. It's uh, consent around emailing and uh, not spamming people. And there is a necessity to have a breach notification. So letting people know that there has been a breach uh, that's taken place and doing so in a timely fashion. There isn't geosensitivity though. Uh, the data can be exported uh, around the world. In the United States, uh, there are a number of pieces of re regulation. Uh, that are now uh, in place. Um, regulations such as uh, HIPAA and uh, COPA and uh, or COPA and um, also if you're in the financial services sector and you're regulated in New York, there's also the NYCRR 500 requirement, which is a cyber security requirement um, enforced by the New York Department of Financial Services. Now, some of those require a CISO or a data protection officer, certainly in the case of NYCRR 500. It's very staffly named. I'm sure you'll, sure you'll agree. Um, they also have uh, the concept of personal data requirements, particularly in the case of uh, HIPAA, where you're talking about medical information and ensuring that that is not uh, shared and it's only used for the purpose for which it's uh, collected. Uh, there's no guaranteed um, consent requirements uh, in the United States at this point in time. Uh, but depending on the regulation you're, that you are adhering to, there is a breach notification. In the case of NYCRR 500, um, that's a 72-hour window. I'm not quite sure how Equifax would have uh, been uh, dealing with that if they'd been regulated uh, by the New York Department of Financial Services. Uh, there is not geosensitivity, so the data can be exported uh, as long as it's being used for the, uh, the correct purpose. I'm going to cover uh, GDPR or the European uh, regulation just at a higher level um, because we will talk about that in a little bit uh, more detail as we go through. But there is a requirement for a CISO or a data protection officer. There is a concept of uh, personal data. You do need to have consent for the use of data. Now, consent means that the data subject or the person providing the data has to say that the data can be used uh, for a particular purpose. And there is also a breach notification requirement. And there is geosensitivity, meaning that uh, the data belonging to European residents must be treated in a particular way, irrespective of where the data is collected or processed around the world. Moving on to Russia next, uh, there's not a CISO or DPO requirement. Uh, there is uh, some concept of personal data. It's not as uh, expansive in, uh, as in other countries, but there is also a consent requirement a breach notification and some geosensitivity as well. Uh, the geosensitivity is that uh, Russian uh, citizen data, um, actually I think it is actually Russian resident data, and must be kept within uh, Russia, uh, so it can't be exported to the United States or things like that. 
do you know I've just read out that one and that's actually China the Russian uh, the Russian one is uh, the next one get my uh, get my flags uh, mixed up there as we move across um, so the Russian one is actually uh, CISO uh, no CISO requirement personal data defined uh, consent uh, consent required and the uh, geo sensitivity and then we move to uh, towards um, the Asia Pacific um, with uh, Australia uh, being used as an example here so there is a need for the CISO or DPO and uh, personal data is required it's a quite a strong uh, definition of personal data also the requirement for consent and breach notification uh, but there is no ge geo sensitivity so uh, the data belonging to uh, Australian residents can be shipped around the world and can be stored and processed on servers in the United States or in Europe or in China for that matter. Uh, there are no uh, requirements on that. Okay, there are a number of countries um, who are recognised by the European Union as providing adequate protection. Now, with the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, um, there are three types of country that are defined. There are first countries, so those are countries within the European Union. There are second countries, those who provide adequate protection. And there are third countries. And third countries are those countries that do not provide adequate protection and they are not part of the European Union. So these countries listed, and I won't read them out, I'm sure you guys can all um, uh, read them on the presentation, although for the benefit of uh, our podcast recording, I guess I ought to read out uh, at least a couple of them, but um, countries like Andorra, Argentina, I already mentioned, um, Canada is included, but only for commercial organizations, Faroe Islands, Guernsey, Israel, the Isle of Man, Jersey, New Zealand, uh, Switzerland, Uruguay, and the United States is uh, listed there, but only if the organization has registered with the EU US Privacy Shield. Okay, so that's an extra piece of um, uh, regulation that uh, a US company needs to follow and that enables them to be held legally accountable for the protection of data within the United States and allows US companies to start to become compliant with the European regulations. Without being part of the EU US Privacy Shield, uh, the United States is considered a third country because it's not felt to have adequate data protection or data privacy regulation without that piece. This is a little bit of a bold statement, but I make it in the best with the best of intentions and explain try to explain why. But the GDPR may became become the standard. The reason I say that is because uh, the European Union has gone to great lengths to ensure that their residents' data is kept safe and it's only used for the purpose for which it was collected for. Now that means that if you are collecting data for, uh, to provide a service, you can't decide at a, uh, a subsequent point to use that data for marketing, for example, without gaining the consent of the, uh, the data subject, the people whose data uh, uh, you're actually using. So it's very important for uh, organizations based in the US or other parts of the world to have a good understanding of what their requirements are um, in complying with the GDPR particularly if you're selling services to European residents, okay, so those based within the European Union, of which there are 28 countries at the moment, soon to be 27 when uh, the UK leaves the European Union, but at this point in time there are 28 countries within the, the European Union. So if you're selling uh, services to France or to Germany, then you need to make sure that you are compliant with the general data protection regulation in order um, to collect data and to be able to process that. Now, the reason I believe that it's going to become the standard is not only because the reach is global for the GDPR, so irrespective of where you're based, you have to comply if, you, if you're collecting and processing that data, but it's also a very client-centric, it's a very customer-focused piece of um, regulation. And I believe, certainly with some of the bigger breaches that we've seen recently, with the likes of Equifax, for example, uh, that um, the residents of other countries, uh, you know, possibly the United States, for example, will start to ask for and expect organizations to treat their data in a, in a similar fashion and also have the requirements to notify them 
if there is a data breach within a far shorter period of time than is in common in, in some of the big breaches that have taken place so far. And I also cite the uh, example here of the fact that the US uh, takes it so seriously and, and the trade between uh, the United States and Europe um, so seriously that they've implemented the EU US uh, privacy shield capability which allows US, US organizations to become compliant or move along the path to compliance with the GDPR. So that's why I make that bold statement around uh, why the, uh, the GDPR may become the standard. I've already explained uh, in some detail about the EU privacy, EU U, US privacy shield. Um, there's some more details here about how it works and also how organisations um, can, uh, can um, uh, become involved. But what I'd really like to uh, get into is some of the major tenets of the privacy shield. Because these are the types of things that organisations need to do in order to comply. And these map very neatly and nicely onto the general data protection regulation as well, the European requirements. So I'll read out uh, the, the key ones of these. Uh, the first pillar is uh, the requirement for notice. Now, all of the, this, uh, this slide uh, that I'm talking to at the moment, slide nine for those who are listening via podcast, uh, is very much a bridge. I'll try to summarize as much as I can the key requirements. If you do want to read the, the full requirement, you should really go to privacyshield.gov and navigate through to the appropriate page on there. The link is on the, on the slide deck in full, so you can navigate your way through. But I've tried to summarize as, as uh, concisely as I can on this slide. So notice, um, the new organization must um, uh, gain uh, or give um, a good notice, a good deal of information about why they're collecting the information from, uh, from the individuals. Okay, and they must have information that links through to the DOC's Privacy Shield list, uh, where, where that organization should be listed, and the details of the personal information that they're collecting, and the data subjects' rights. So what uh, action um, someone who's providing their data can take uh, in order to establish what data is being kept, uh, what personal data is being used and how it's being used and those things, those kind of things. The second requirement is choice. Um, the organisation must provide individuals, the data subjects, with the ability to opt out when data is provided to third parties or for uses other than those that it was uh, collected. From. Now the best practice here is actually to have it as opt-in rather than forcing people to opt out. Okay, in, in Europe that's a requirement under the EU US uh, Privacy Shield uh, you can actually um, require people to opt, uh, opt out. So you can have them as a default as opted in for marketing purposes for example and have them opt, uh, uh, opt out of that uh, by unticking the box. You must also identify the onward transfer. So if you're using a secondary organization to process the data, and processing is a uh, quite a complex uh, subject. It actually covers the entire life cycle of the data, right from collection through use and uh, updating and maintenance and um, go through to archiving and ultimately through to destruction. All of that is considered to be processing. Okay, so you must be able to identify uh, which third parties you're using to process this data, and they must be able to, um, must be held account to processing it in the way that is consistent with the purpose it was collected for. So just because um, the data is being passed on to a third party, it can't, uh, they can't use it for marketing purposes, or they can't market uh, use it for marketing of your organization on your behalf because if the, the data subjects have said that they didn't uh, opt into that. So that full chain there must be maintained and uh, the, the use of the data and the reason for its collection must be uh, fully respected. The uh, fourth uh, principle is uh, that organizations must maintain um, good security. They must make uh, take appropriate actions and reasonable actions to ensure that the data isn't misused, that it can't be easily breached or lost or used for other purposes other than those that it was collected for. Okay, and that again goes right the way through the life cycle of the of the data processing. Data uh, data integrity is the fifth principle. Um, that means that the, the data can only be used again for the purpose it was collected for, 
and only retain for as long as is reasonable. So that means that if you're um, part of uh, an HR organization, for example, that means that you can't collect the resumes of those of, uh, individuals who applied for jobs, and you can't keep those, uh, those resumes for 20 years, for example. Most organizations that would be considered an unreasonable period of time to maintain or keep, a, a, a keep personal data of that type. Uh, if there's a good reason for it and it's a justifiable reason, then that's absolutely fine. And likewise, if you're making the data subjects, the individuals whose, whose data it is, uh, if you're making them aware of the fact that it's going to be uh, kept for that, that period of time and they're comfortable with that, again, that's okay too. But you have to be able to defend the, uh, the duration that you're maintaining the data for and you must have good destruction uh, capabilities and, uh, and be able to evidence all these things too. Uh, the sixth uh, principle is access, so individuals must have access to the personal information um, that is maintained and co uh, collected and processed by an organization. Um, individuals have the, have the right to actually request a, uh, a list of the data and details of the data, uh, the personal data that is being kept by an organization. Uh, under the GDPR, that's called a subject access request and uh, there are timescales under which that data has to be provided. Uh, you know, the, uh, so the request must be answered within a certain um, duration. And the final principle under the EU US Privacy Shield requirement is ensuring uh, that there are robust mechanisms and controls in place to ensure that all of these principles are adhered to. And these are enforceable under US uh, under US law. So once you sign up to the EU US uh, Privacy Shield, whilst it's an optional, um, uh, yeah, it's an optional piece of legislation that you're signing, signing up to, once you do so, it is actually contractual and you can actually be prosecuted then under US, uh, under US law for not actually following uh, the framework. So it's something that organizations need to think carefully about before they uh, go ahead and, and do that. Um, but if they're, uh, if you're an international organization in dealing with the European Union and residents within the EU, then you should very much um, be looking at that and considering that as a requirement. So I've uh, talked a little bit at a high level about uh, the European General Data Protection Regulation. Um, let's get into some of the headlines and some of the, the details of what GDPR means. So here we've got uh, four high level headlines. Um, uh, GDPR applies to organizations irrespective of their, of their location if they are collecting, storing, or otherwise processing personal or sensitive information about EU residents, and this includes processing within the United States. GDPR will apply to UK-based companies irrespective of, of Brexit. So if you have a branch of your organization that's based in the UK, um, don't think just because the UK is coming out of um, the European Union, uh, that uh, they won't have to apply to GDPR. Uh, the UK government has already said that they um, fully support uh, GDPR and data protection will, con uh, will continue at the, same, uh, at the same level and the same level of equivalence. Now here's the teeth of GDPR, and this is why organizations around the world are um, concerned and taking more notice of uh, GDPR than perhaps they may have done with our previous data protection regulation. The fines for non-compliance can be as high as 20 million euros or 4% of annual turnover, whichever is the higher. Okay, so if your organization is a smaller organization, it may be that 20 million euros would be the, the, the maximum fine. If you are a, a multi-billion dollar company, um, then it could be as high as 4% of your annual global turnover. And uh, for those of you in the US, uh, 20 million euros is uh, current exchange rates around about $24 million. Okay, so it's uh, GDPR has some teeth. And then final headline here, GDPR will be enforced from May 25th, uh, 2018. So it's um, not too far away now. Um, what are we now? Probably about seven months away from now. Fifth step is very often asked uh, for this, uh, this kind of high level view of uh, should an organization or will an organization have to implement GDPR. So we put together this very high level view and as I say on the bottom of the slide, 
this is a very summarized diagram and you really shouldn't use this to, um, to completely replace a formal assessment process. But it, it is used as a, as a guide or can be used as a guide. So there are um, uh, five questions uh, that I pose here um, in order for you to understand whether you're going to have to be uh, compliant with the GDPR. So is your organization based in the EU? Uh, does it have staff in the EU? Uh, does it offer services to EU residents? Uh, does it process EU personal data? Um, does it plan to do any of these things in the future? So if you're answering no to all of those questions, then you probably don't have to comply with GDPR. If you answer yes to any one of those questions, then you probably do have to comply with GDPR. Um, there are some uh, exceptions uh, to that, but on the whole, you're probably going to have to comply. So this is a very high level diagram, but I think you get the, uh, uh, the gist of what it's trying to convey. As with the principles uh, for the EU US Privacy Shield, I've laid out some of the, the key terms and terminology. Now, I've already been using some of these, but I'll run through these just because they are so important to understand. And they're not to particularly difficult concepts once you understand them, but if you're reading about GDPR or you're reading about uh, data privacy in other locations, uh, very often these terms will be used. And um, if you uh, haven't read this, uh, this quick gl glossary or listened to the, 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 the explanations, then it can be a little bit more confusing than it need be. So the concept of a data controller. Um, a data controller is the personal company um, who determines the purpose and manner of processing of the personal data. Okay, so it's the body um, who is responsible for the data. Now that may be in most uh, uh, in most um, of the clients that we're talking to. That's the actual organisation themselves. Okay, so you have a company that is offering a service to individuals, it's their company themselves who, are, who um, are the data controller. Because they are saying, we are collecting your data for the purpose of uh, offering, uh, offering our service. Data processor is a third party to the, the data controller. And uh, if you outsource some of your data processing, um, that third party that you outsource to would be um, uh, considered a data processor. Okay, so data processing, as I've uh, mentioned a couple of a couple of times, is anything to do with the collection of or processing of data, right from um, you know collecting it, storing it, uh, manipulating, reporting upon it, deleting it, um, updating it. Any of those kind of things are all considered to be data processing. So any of those aspects, if you have a third party doing that, then they are a data processor and they have to follow the same rules as uh, the data controller. Now, interestingly enough, under GDPR, the data controller remains responsible for the data irrespective of who they provide that data to. So if they give it to a third party and that third party has a data breach, the data controller is still liable for that breach and still responsible for that breach, still has to um, uh, perform the data, the uh, data breach uh, notification process, for example. Consent is a really important aspect under the GDPR. Um, each data subject, so the, so the individuals providing the data, uh, must be given very clear information about what the data is going to be used for, and they must consent to its uh, consent to its use before that information is provided. So you can't. Um, collect the data and then say, oh, we're going to uh, email you a list of the ways that we're going to use this data. It needs to be provided up front, and the consent should be positive consent, um, i.e. opt-in. Now, there are some circumstances, and they probably go beyond the, uh, uh, the bounds of what I'll cover today in this webinar, but there are some uh, exceptions to having to provide that, that information up front. Um, but if if, uh, if you can provide that information up front, you really need to be doing so. So if you're, um, if you're considering, oh, well, that, if that would be very difficult for us, then, uh, then we would, um, uh, you wouldn't really very much need to go into uh, a little bit more detail. Okay, uh, the purpose. The purpose for which the data is uh, collected 
is uh, very important as well. You can't clearly communicate why the data is being used and how it's being used without a purpose. So having a clear purpose that's in plain English or, or French, if it's uh, uh, targeting uh, uh, French data subjects, for example, but a clearly written and clearly communicated purpose is very important. Now, none of this would exist without the concept of personal data. So the concept of personal data is anything that is able to identify a an individual, and this includes um, um, things like uh, uh, bank codes or account uh, uh, bank account numbers, uh, credit card numbers, even IP addresses are now considered to be personal information under the GDPR. So make sure that you understand what the concepts of personal data are. It's not just name, address, email address, uh, telephone number, or anything like that. It is a similar definition in some respects to PII under. Um, you know, uh, that's uh, a term that's commonly used in, in the United States, for example, but it's not uh, exactly the same. It's any data that can be used to identify an individual. So even if it's uh, just a passport number is the only thing you're collecting, that is the sort of data that you're going to need to um, treat as personal data. And then we move on to personal sensitive data. Um, now, this is a special classification of personal data and it tends to, to um, uh, cover the, the type of data which has previously been used to uh, persecute, persecute people in the past. So it may be about uh, racial or ethnic um, inf um, information or details, um, political opinions, uh, trade union membership, um, psychological or mental, um, uh, or mental health and things like that, and um, uh, religious beliefs of all types. Um, criminal history is also covered, and new to the GDPR is the concept of biometric and genetic information also being um, considered to be sensitive information. Now, I'm sure we'd all agree that that's uh, that's you know that's perfectly right that that information should be gathered there. But there are many organisations who are now having to um, uh, add new processes and procedures because of that uh, that additional information. Okay, so I give the full definition here of what personal data means. I gave the, um, uh, the high level there. I won't go into the full detail here, but it is included in the slide deck, so it does give you the, um, uh, the full verbatim uh, description of what personal data means. But essentially, it's any, any information uh, that can be used to identify a living individual. One question that I get asked a lot when I'm talking, particularly to senior executives and, uh, um, and board members, um, there's sometimes a confusion that uh, GDPR um, covers only uh, digital data, so any data that can be stored on a hard drive or, or, or on a computer. Um, actually, it covers all information, so that's, uh, that's printed documentation, documentation that's held in a filing cabinet is all actually covered by the GDPR. So don't think that it's, uh, um, that it's just data that's um, that's held on a database or, or, or within a Word document, for example, if that's not the case. I also include the personal sensitive data um, definition as well. Um, uh, I've gone into that in some detail, but it is useful to, uh, to have that there as a summary for you um, if you're dealing with in the implementation of GDPR. The importance of the data collection purpose is our, is our next slide here. So it's very important that any individual who's providing their data has a clear understanding of why the data is being collected. And as I said earlier, that needs to be in, in plain language, uh, no legalese, um, very plain as to what the data is being used for, who's, uh, who's going to be using it. If it's going to be processed outside of uh, the European Union, or the uh, extended economic area, the EEA, uh, which includes uh, Switzerland. Um, if it's going to be processed outside of that region, um, then that needs to be made clear um, to the data subject uh, before they actually provide the data so that they can decide, actually, I don't want my information going to um, Argentina, or, um, or actually Argentina would be okay because that's, uh, that's uh, uh, considered an equivalency country, but I don't want my information going to China, for example. I actually um, would rather use another service that doesn't send my data to China for processing. Now, these are the high-level rights of uh, the data subject. So I'll run through what these actually mean, um, and I will do that at a high level. 
um, uh, and you can read more uh, more about this, uh, both within the slide deck, but also there's lots of information, including on the Fifth Step website, and I'll uh, uh, you, uh, I'll provide details of that at, uh, at a later date. But I'll run through these at some uh, with some pace. The right to be informed um, is the first right of the data subject. Now, the rights of the data subject are um, are there uh, for data subjects to be able to enforce at any time after the data has been collected including a number of years later. Okay, so if you're holding data for 20 years, then the data subject has the right to ask uh, any of these questions or enforce any of these rights um, at any time after the data has been collected. Okay, so the right to be informed. Um, that really goes back to the purpose and the data collection purpose. So the data subject has the right to be informed about what the data is used for. The right of access, um, the data subject has the right to access the, the data that, uh, that you're holding on them, the personal data. Um, so they can make a subject access request, as I described earlier, uh, where you have to detail all of the information, the personal information and the personal sensitive information uh, that you're holding about them. And obviously all of these rights have to be rigor rigorously enforced to ensure that the data subject is the person who's asking for the information and the person asking for the information has the right to, to obtain that information. Otherwise you could be uh, actually uh, uh, um, perpetrating a data breach. Uh, the right to rectification is uh, essentially the right for the data be, to be corrected. If a data subject asks for a copy of their data and establishes that um, you're actually confusing um, them with uh, a relative or someone else who has a similar name who lives in the same area as them, uh, then they have the right for that data to be corrected and that for that mistake to be um, uh, corrected and put right. Uh, the right to erasure, um, so uh, I'm going to avoid making jokes about uh, 1980s uh, uh, bands, uh, one called erasure at this point in time, uh, but the right to erasure is really the right to uh, request that the data be deleted. Okay. Now there are exceptions to this. Um, if the data cannot be deleted for legal reasons, for example, um, then um, uh, the organisation has the right to say, no, we can't delete that data. Um, if the data requested is required for the provision of the service, uh, then the organisation has the right to go back and say, well, we can't delete this data and provide the service, um, in which case the data subject may obviously cancel the service and ask for the data to be uh, deleted. But all of those rights exist. And again, and to reinforce, these, these rights exist from any time after the data has been collected. The right to restrict processing um, really comes back to uh, if the data is incorrect or if the data is being used um, for a purpose other than uh, what it was intended, you know, what it was stated it was being collected for. So if the data is now being used for the provision of a service and for marketing, data subject has the right to uh, request that data not be used for marketing um, because that's not what they signed up for. The right to data portability is a really interesting right. I think this is going to shake things up a little bit in a number of different sectors. Uh, but the right to data portability, it means that the uh, data subject has the right to request their personal data in a machine readable form, so in XML or a, a CSV file or some other industry standard file, uh, file type. Uh, and the purpose for that is obviously so they can provide it to another provider. So in my mind, I'm thinking about um, you know all of the uh, insurance uh, websites um, that uh, you can go to and you can get your motor quote and you submit your details once. I think in future they're going to be asking um, for you to give them the right to ask for your data from your existing insurer so they can actually facilitate the movement uh, between one provider and another provider. I'm sure that's going to increase their, um, um, increase their success rates and increase the, uh, the commission that they're going to be looking for for, for, for providing that service. The right to object, this one's um, quite closely linked, I believe, to the right to restrict processing. So a data subject has the right to, um, to object to um, their data being processed. So not only can they restrict processing, so they can say, well, you can continue to use it for uh, this purpose, but not, but not this purpose, they can object uh, completely. Okay, that, that may be on the path to them asking for their data to be removed, or it may be that they're objecting because 
uh, you're actually now using it for marketing purposes. You didn't say you were going to do that, uh, and they're raising a, a formal complaint about that. And the final right is the right to manual processing. This again, I think it's going to shake, so, shake things up in some areas. Um, the example I tend to use here is for um, a bank, for example, that's uh, offering mortgages uh, to people. Uh, very often these days, banks will use you know, credit scoring and a number of our algorithms to actually go through, collect uh, the data that you've provided, uh, provide some analysis, uh, analysis of that data, but ultimately, ultimately it may be an algorithm that decides whether you're eligible for that mortgage or not. Now, under the GDPR, um, organizations uh, based in Europe have to be able to provide the right to manual processing. Now, that means you have to be able to have a human being who can uh, look at an individual case and say, I agree with the computer's assessment here, um, this, is, uh, this is correct, they shouldn't be allowed a mortgage because of these, uh, these reasons, or actually the computer's wrong in this, uh, in this instance and I overrule that decision by the computer and um, therefore we will be providing, um, uh, providing a mortgage or offering a mortgage to this person. Now the implications there are not only that you have to have the business processes to be able to support all of these rights, but you know, particularly in this case the right to manual processing, but your computer systems also have to be able to deal with the fact that you're going to um, uh, have a process in place, an automated process in place, but it can be uh, overridden at some point by, uh, you know, by a reviewer. It's a very important uh, aspect and one that I think many organisations are uh, not um, not fully aware of um, and I think it will be challenged a number of times uh, by individuals as they uh, as they start to be rejected for um, automated you know, mortgage uh, uh, mortgage office for example. Now we spoke earlier on when I was talking about some of the other uh, regulation around the world we spoke about the need for a data protection officer so the need for a data protection officer is um, a requirement, it's a stated requirement under the GDPR, as it is with a number of other pieces of regulation. Um, I mentioned earlier on uh, NYCRR 500, for example, which has a, a requirement for a, a, a CISO or CISO um, to be in place. So, uh, data protection officer is responsible for all of those things that, have, uh, that are listed there on the right hand side, and I'll read those out for our. Uh, podcast listeners, but uh, they're responsible for the protection and accuracy of the data, for the data protection policies and procedures, for working with the data protection authority. So if you have a data breach, um, it's a data protection officer who has to notify the, um, the data protection authority and they have to do so within 72 hours. Um, they're um, responsible for any data protection issues, uh, they're responsible for data categorization and they're uh, responsible for data retention adherence and uh, the implementation of uh, the policies uh, uh, around data retention too. So this can be a, a, a large requirement. Um, now smaller organizations, you don't have to have a dedicated resource uh, to this. It can be someone's uh, part-time job. Um, as long as it's a named individual, in most instances that's going to be more than enough. Okay, but for larger organizations or mid-sized organizations, you are going to need to have someone who, um, uh, who's responsible for this. They're going to need to be knowledgeable about what the requirements are. That too goes for the smaller organizations, but there may be a, enough training that for a smaller organization you can, uh, you can do to cover it internally. But where that's not possible, there are organizations uh, of which uh, Fifth Step is one of those organizations that provide a data protection uh, Officer, uh, fifth step's a little bit unique in the way that we do that um, because we are able to do that as a flex up and flex down service, so a, a fractional and flexible service. And if that's something that any of you guys listening or watching uh, this are, are interested in, then do please reach out to me. I'm more than happy to uh, run you through the benefits of that. Here's some high-level guidance about what to do next in respect to uh, GDPR. This framework can very much be used for any data protection regulation around the world. Uh, very much the, the, the requirements are very, very similar um, as, you, uh, as you look around the world, and they're increasingly so. And that's not an accident. Um, you know, the, the data protection regulators are getting together. Uh, I'm sure they're very fun Christmas parties where they get together and uh, they talk through 
uh, the things that are working in their countries and things that aren't working and how they might work uh, together uh, differently and make sure there's good crossover between the, uh, between um, the various regulation around the world. So this list can be used not only with the GDPR, uh, but it can be used with other regulations. So the first step, data categorization and data flow. So understand what personal data you're collecting, how it's flowing, how is it being collected, where is it going to, you know, which third parties is it going to, and things like that. Checking your policies, processes, and procedures against uh, the, the regulation you're uh, looking to comply with. So if that's GDPR, look at the GDPR requirements. Are your policies, processes, and procedures actually helping you comply and, and helping you demonstrate your compliance? Making sure that your computer systems have the ability to fulfill all the data subjects' rights. So are your computer systems actually helping you comply, or are they actually hindering you? Uh, you know, perhaps it's not possible to delete some of the data uh, from your databases. Have you got a data incident response plan? Um, so if there is a breach, have you got a plan um, that you can execute right now um, that, that says what you would do, who you would contact, how you would go about stemming the, the flow? You know, if you actually discover you're having a breach whilst the data is being stolen, do you know what to do? Do you know who you would contact? Um, if you're in the United States, for example, the breach requirements uh, between states uh, vary and the timescales um, that you have to uh, adhere to vary. But in the United States, you also have to notify law enforcement too. Um, so look at those kind of things. Have you got that incident response plan? Uh, under the GDPR and under NYCRR 500, you have to be able to respond within 72 hours. Okay, not the six months that Equifax took or the four and a half years that uh, Yahoo took, 72 hours. It's a real, um, you know, this is going to shake things up um, in terms of uh, organizations having to, be um, having to be able to respond to a data, uh, a data breach. Now that's 72 hours from the point of notification. It's not, uh, you know, if you're hacked um, six months ago and you find out about it today, uh, the clock starts running from the point, the, uh, point of discovery, obviously not from the point of breach. Understand any geographic requirements and restrictions. Um, understand, can you export the data? Where can you export it to? Uh, do you need uh, contractual agreements with um, organizations in, in, in countries outside of Europe, for example? Or, um, you know, in the case of the United States, is the organization you're sending the data to part of the EU-US uh, Privacy Shield Agreement? And finally, I'm a big fan of continual improvement um, and making sure that um, you're maintaining your compliance. None of these things are a one and done. They're, they're really not. It's not a project. It's a project to get it implemented, but then you need to come back and you need to revisit these things and make sure that your organization hasn't changed around the regulation or the, the regulation hasn't changed around your organization. So implement a, a continual improvement process. Regulators tend to love this kind of stuff too because it allows um, you to demonstrate to them that you've actually got a process. Um, to log any shortcomings that you've got at the moment. Obviously, if there's serious flaws, you should be dealing with them. But where there are items that you've noted for improvement um, in the next cycle, um, regulators tend to love that kind of stuff. So we're going to start moving um, into uh, questions and the, uh, the Q&A piece now. So if there's uh, any questions that you've got, then I'll, uh, I'm more than happy to, uh, to take those as, uh, as we move through. And um, I'll just flip through these next couple of slides as people start to ask those questions. Um, I've spoken about the, uh, the Data Protection Officer Service. Um, it's in, the details are in the slide, but come to the Fifth Step website and uh, I'm more than happy to talk you through that, talk about the benefits of that to your organization. If you're really keen, uh, I've written a book about uh, GDPR um, and it's available on the Amazon store. I would love for you guys to read it and give me the, uh, the feedback and the thumbs up or indeed uh, um, some uh, areas where you think it needs some uh, some more coverage. It's called the Little Book of GDPR because it is only a little book, though. So it covers in more depth some of the details we've covered today. And if you want to know even more, come back to the uh, Fifth Step website, uh, listen to our podcasts, and watch our videos. So if there's any questions, um, I'm more than happy to uh, answer any of those uh, any of those questions now. I have a comment, uh, Darren. Well, thank you very much for uh, this presentation. I think that was uh, 
eye-opening, at least uh, for me, despite the fact that I'm uh, dealing with the international issues day in, day out. Uh, they are related to benefits and uh, su sufficient to say that we are uh, exchanging a lot of data uh, pretty much on a daily basis and uh, I may, uh, may confess that probably we're taking a little bit uh, the data uh, privacy situation uh, lightly than we should have and it was kind of interesting to know how things are varied based on the different country situations and uh, we, wor we work with uh, partner brokers in uh, those countries uh, like China, Australia, Argentina and other uh, 160 countries around the world but uh, that was kind of very interesting to see uh, how in different countries uh, uh, situations are dealt differently on this subject of data privacy and uh, data uh, governance and um, never we thought uh, uh, that uh, something like that would come to existence uh, 24 years ago when the Globex uh, came to existence uh, itself it, uh, it granted the global uh, the, the world is coming uh, uh, more global on an everyday basis but uh, the issues that we have to deal uh, uh, over the couple years related uh, to the de data privacy and uh, all other uh, issues uh, related to the subject of the presentation is really staggering. Thank you very much. That was uh, a very interesting uh, presentation and we will uh, definitely have a, a different uh, look at all the issues that uh, presented in your great uh, presentation. Well, thank you very much. That's, um, that's really kind uh, uh, feedback. I really appreciate it. And, uh, um, obviously, if, uh, um, you know, if you've got any questions, do come back um, after the event. Um, and for anyone listening to the, um, the podcast or indeed watching the, uh, the video presentation of the webinar the recorded, recording, um, you know, do uh, come back, ask the questions. I'm always open to asking, answering questions uh, for people who are trying to get this stuff implemented. And, you know, you can well, you can find me very easily from the Fifth Step website or on LinkedIn or on Twitter and things like that. And I do answer uh, questions and try to provide uh, the best uh, uh, feedback to those kind of things as, a, uh, as I can. Because I understand how confusing it can be for, for people in different uh, countries trying to implement this and uh, it can be confusing for everyone. Great. Well, um, Valentine, was there anything else that you wanted to, uh, to say or for Silla, if there's any other questions from you? Um, if not, I'm going to um, go, uh, uh, draw us to a, uh, a close and, uh, and we'll get this, uh, get this uh, webinar um, closed out and uh, up onto YouTube and up onto the, the podcast channel. Excellent presentation, Darren. Very informative, and I'll make sure and uh, shoot you specific emails uh, that any clients have of mine, and I really appreciate your time. This is great. Thank you very much, guys.